Stories of Futures Past presents five stories featuring outdated future tech. Dogfight 1973 by Mac Reynolds. Tape Jockey by Tom Lee. A Thousand Dollars a Plate by Jack McKenty. The Man Who Wouldn't Sign Up by Tom Purdom. Hysterio by Maurice Baudin. Dogfight 1973 by Mac Reynolds. Originally published by Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, July 1953. Narrated by Tom Trussell. My radar picked him up when he was about 500 miles to my north-northeast and about 45 miles above me. I switched the velocity calculator on him as fast as I could reach it. The enemy ship was doing 16, possibly even 16 and a half. I took the chance that it was the most likely an Ivor interceptor at that speed and punched out a temporary evasion pattern with my right hand while with my left I snapped an Ivor K-12 card into my calculator, along with its estimated speed, altitude and distance. It wasn't much to go on as yet, but it couldn't have much more on me, if as much. Inwardly I congratulated myself on the quick identification I'd managed. He was near enough now for my visor screen to pick him up. At least he was alone, that was something. My nearest squadron mate was a good minute and a half away. It might as well have been the century. Now this is what is always hard to get over to a civilian. The time element. Understand, it will take me a while to tell this, but it all took less than sixty seconds to happen. He had guessed my evasion pattern already. Either guessed it, or had some new calculator that was far and beyond anything our techs were turning out. I could tell he'd anticipated me by the bong sonic roll he slipped into. I quickly punched up a new pattern based on the little material I had in the calculator. At least I'd caught the roll. I punched that up, hurriedly, slipped it into the IBM, guessed that his next probability was a pass, took a chance on that and punched it in. I was wrong there. He didn't take this opportunity for a front-on pass. He was either newly out of their academy or insultingly confident. My lips felt tight as I cancelled the frontal pass card, punched up two more to take its place. The base supervisor cut in on the phone. It looks like old Dimitri himself, Jerry, and is flying one of the new K-12A models. Go get him, boy! I felt like snapping back. He knew better than to break in on me at a time like this. I opened my mouth, then shut it again. Did he say K-12A? Did he say K-12A? I squinted at the visor screen. The high tail, the canopy, the oddly shaped wing tanks. I'd gone off on the identification. I slapped another evasion pattern into the controls, a standard set. I had no time to punch up an improvisation. But he was on me like a wasp. I rejected it, threw in another set, reject, another. Even as I worked, I kicked the release on my own calculator, dumped it all, selected like a flash an Ivor K-12A card and what other estimations I could make while my mind was busy with a full-time job of evasion. My hands were still making the motions, my fingers were flicking here, there, my feet touching here, there, but my heart wasn't in it. He already had such an advantage that it was all I could do to keep him in my visor screen. He was to the left, to the right, I got him for a full quarter second in the wires, but the autogunner was too far behind, much too far. His own guns flicked red. I punched half a dozen buttons, slapped levers, tried to scoot for home. To the left of my cubicle, two lights went yellowish, and at the same time my visor screen went dead. I was blind. I sank back in my chair, helpless. The speed indicator wavered went slowly, deliberately, to zero. The altimeter died, the fuel gauge. Finally, even the dozen or so troubled indicators here, there, everywhere about the craft. 
15 million dollars worth of warcraft was being shot into wreckage. I sat there for a long, long minute and took it. Then I got to my feet and wearily opened the door of my cubicle. Sergeant Walters and the rest of the maintenance crew were standing there. They could read in my face what had happened. The sergeant began. Captain, I... I grunted at him. Never mind, sergeant. It had nothing to do with the ship's condition. I turned to head for the operations office. Bill Dixon strolled over from the direction of his own cubicle. Somebody said you had just had a scramble with old Dimitri himself. I don't know, I said. I don't know if it was him or not. Maybe some of you guys can tell a man's flying, but I can't. He grinned at me. Shut you down, eh? I didn't answer. He said, What happened? I thought it was an Ivar K-12, and I put that card in my calculator. Turned out it was one of those new models, K-12A. That was enough, of course. Bill grinned at me again. That's two this week. That flak got you near that bridge, and now you get... Shut up, I told him. He counted up on his fingers elaborately. The way I figure it, you lose one more ship, and you're an enemy ace. He was irrepressible. Damn it, I said. Will you cut it out? I've got enough to worry about without you working me over. This means I'll have to spend another half an hour in operations going over the flight, and that means I'll be late for dinner again, and you know Molly. Bill sobered. Gee, he said. I'm sorry. War is hell, isn't it? The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Tape Jockey by Tom Lee Originally published in If Worlds of Science Fiction, March 1954 Narrated by Tom Trisser The little man said, Why, Mr. Bartle, come in. This is indeed a pleasure. His pinched face was lighted with an enthusiastic smile. You know my name, so I suppose you know the bulletin sent me for a personality interview. The tall man who stood in the doorway said in a monotone as if it was a statement he had made a thousand times, which he had. Oh, certainly, Mr. Bartle. I was informed by Section Secretary Andrews this morning. I must say I am greatly honoured by this visit, too. Oh, heavens, here I am letting you stand in the doorway. Excuse my discourtesy, sir. Come in, come in, the little man said, and bustled the bored Bartle into a great room. The walls of the room were lined by grey metal boxes that had spools of reproduction tape mounted on their vertical fronts, tape recorders, hundreds of them. I have a rather lonely occupation, Mr. Bartle, and sometimes the common courtesy slip my mind. It is a rather grievous fault, and I beg you to overlook it. It would be rather distressing to me if Section Secretary Andrews were to hear of it. He has a rather intolerant attitude towards such faux pas. Do you understand what I mean? Not that I'm dissatisfied with my superior. Perish the thought. It's just that. Don't worry, I won't breathe a word, the tall man interrupted without looking at the babbling fellow shuffling along at his side. Mr. Pettigill... I don't want to keep you from your work for too long, so I'll just get a few notes and make up the bulk of the story back at the paper. Bartle searched the room with his eyes. Don't you have a chair in this place? Oh, my gracious, yes! There goes that old discourtesy again, eh? The little man, Pettigill, said with a dry laugh. He scurried about the room like a confused squirrel until he spotted a chair behind his desk. My chair! My chair for you, Mr. Bartle! Again the dry laugh. Thanks, Mr. Pettigill. Arthur, call me Arthur. Formality really isn't necessary among mid-echelon, do you think? Section Secretary Andrews has often requested I call him Morton, but I just can't seem to bring myself to such informality. After all, he is sub-prime echelon. It makes one uncomfortable, shall we say, to step out of one's class? He stopped talking, and the corners of his mouth dropped quickly, as if he had just been given one minute to live. You. You are only mid-echelon, aren't you? I mean, if you are sub-prime, I shouldn't be... Relax, Mr. Pettigill. Arthur, I am mid-echelon. 
and I am only that because my father was a man of far more industry than I. I inherited my classification. So, well now, interesting, very. He must have been a great man, a great man, Mr. Bartle. So I am told, Arthur, but let's get on with it, Bartle said, taking some scrap paper and a pencil stub from his tunic pocket. Now tell me about yourself and the Meadow Sykes Centre. Well, the little man began with a sigh and blinked his eyes peculiarly as though he were mentally shuffling events and facts like a deck of cards. Well, I... my life will be of little interest, but the centre is of the utmost importance. That's it. I am no more than a physical extremity that functions in accord with the vital life that courses through the great physique of the centre. No more. I ask no more than to serve the centre, and in turn, my fellow citizens, whether they be prime, subprime, mid, or even sub-lower. He stopped speaking, affecting a martyr-like pose. Bartle covered a smile with his hand. Well, Bartle, as you know, the centre, the Melosyc Centre, a thoroughly inadequate name for the installation, I might say, is the point of broadcast for these many taped musical selections contrived by Mass Psych as a therapeutic treatment for the various echelon levels. It is the great psychiatrist, the father confessor. For where can one bear one's soul or soothe one's nerves and disposition frayed by a day's endeavour better than in the tender yet firm embrace of music? Bartle was straining to follow the train of thought that was lost in the camouflage of Pettigill's flowery phraseology. "'You see all about you these many recorders, Mr. Bartle?' Bartle nodded. "'On those machines, sir, are spools of tape, music tapes, all music. My heavens, every kind, classical music, jazz, western, all kinds of music. Some tapes are no more than a single melodious note, sustained for whatever length of time necessary to relax and please the echelon-level home it is being beamed to. Oh, I tell you, Mr. Bartle, when the last tape has expended itself for the day, as our service code suggests, I leave this great edifice with a feeling of profound pride in the fact that I have so served my fellow man. You share that feeling too, don't you, Mr. Bartle? Bartle shrugged. Pettigill paused and looked at the watch he carried on a long change attached to a clasp on his tunic. A Benz chronometer given to me by Section Secretary Andrews on the completion of my twenty-five years of service. It's radio-synchronized with a master timepiece in Greenland. It gives me a feeling of close communion with my superiors, if you understand what I mean. Bartle did not. He said, Am I keeping you from your work? If I am... I believe I can fill in on most of this back at the paper. We have files on the centre's operation. The little man hurriedly put out a hand to restrain Bartle, who was easing out of the chair. Not yet, Mr. Bartle, he said, suddenly much more sober. Then his incongruous pomposity appeared again. My gracious, no, you aren't keeping me from my work. I just must start the mid-lower echelon tape. It won't take a moment. Tonight they receive Concerto for Asses Jawbone. Sounds rather ridiculous, doesn't it? Be that as it may, there is a certain stimulation in its rhythmic cacophony. Aboriginality, yes, I would say it arouses a primitive exaltation. He flicked a switch above the recorder, turned a knob, and pressed the starter button on the machine. The tape began winding slowly from one spool to another. Is it casting? Bartle asked. I don't hear a thing. Pettigill laughed. My stars, no, you can't hear it. See, he pointed at a needle doing a staccato dance on the meter face of the machine. That tells me everything is operating properly. Mass Psych advises us never to listen to casts. The selections were designed by them for a specific social and intellectual levels. It could cause us to experience a rather severe emotional disturbance. A peculiar look came over Bartle's face. Is there ever a time when all the machines run at once, that is, when every echelon home is tuned to the Melosyc tape casts? Pettigill registered surprise. Why, certainly, Mr. Bartle. Don't you know Amendment 34206-B specifically states that all echelon homes must receive music therapy at 2300 hours every night? Of course, different tapes to different homes. That's what I mean. "'Haven't you been abiding by the directive, Mr. Bartle?' 
I told you I owed my classification to my father's industry. I'm definitely lax in my duties. Pettigill laughed, almost wickedly, Bartle thought. What I'm getting at is, Bartle continued, what if the wrong casts were channeled into the various homes? I remind you, sir, I'm in charge of the centre and have been for thirty years. Not even the slightest mistake of that nature has ever occurred during that time. That I can believe, Pettigill, Bartle said, his voice edged with sarcasm. But, hypothetically, if it were to happen, what would the reaction be? The little man fidgeted with his watch chain, then he leaned close to Bartle and said in a barely audible whisper, "'This isn't for publication in your article, is it?' "'You don't think the government would allow that, do you? No, this is to satisfy my own curiosity.' "'Well, since we're both mid-echelon, brothers, so to speak, I suppose we can share a secret. It will be disastrous. I firmly believe it will be disastrous, Mr. Bartle. He moved closer to the tall man. I recall a secret administrative directive we received here twenty years ago concerning just that. In essence, it stated that, though music therapy has its great advantages, if the pattern of performance were broken or altered, a definite erratic emotional reaction would develop on the part of the citizens. That was twenty years ago, and I shudder to think what might be the response now, especially if the cast were completely foreign to the recipient. He gave a little shudder to emphasize the horror of the occurrence. It would make psychotics of the entire citizenry. That's what would happen, a nation of psychotics. The fellow who didn't hear the miscast would be top dog, eh, Pettigill? He could call his shots. Pettigill turned the watch chain faster between a forefinger and thumb. No, he'd gain nothing, he said, staring as though hypnotized by the whirling gold chain. It would take more than one sane person to control the derelict population. Perhaps, perhaps two, he mumbled. Yes, I think perhaps two could. You and who else, Pettigill? Pettigill stepped back and drew himself erect. What? You actually entertain the idea that— He laughed dryly. Oh, you're pulling my leg here, eh, Mr. Bartle. I suppose I am. Well, such a remark gives one a jolt, if you know what I mean. Even though we are speaking of a hypothetical occurrence, we must be cautious about such talk, Mr. Bartle. Although a government is a benevolent organization, it is ill-disposed towards such ideas. He cleared his throat. Now, is there anything else I can tell you about the center? Bartle arose from the chair, stuffing the scrap paper and unused pencil back in his pocket. Thanks, no, he said. I think this will cover it. Oh, yes, the article will appear in this Sunday's edition. Thanks, Pettigill, for giving me your time. Oh, I wish to thank you, Mr. Bartle. Being featured in a bulletin article is the ultimate to a man such as I, a man whose only wishes are to serve his country and his brothers. I'm sure you're doing both with great efficiency, Bartle said as he apathetically shook Pettigill's hand and started towards the door. A moment, Mr. Bartle, the little man called. Bartle stopped and turned. I perceive, Mr. Bartle, you are a man of exceptional ability. Pettigill said and cleared his throat. It seems a shame to waste such talent. It should be directed towards some definite goal. Do you understand what I mean? After all, we're all brothers, you know. It would be for my benefit as well as yours. Sure, sure, brother, Bartle snorted and left. He started for the paper office, but decided to let the story go until morning. What the hell, he had a stock format for all such articles. The people were the same, selfless, heroic type, citizens working for the mutual good of all. Only the names were different. And yet, this pettigill had disturbed him. Perhaps it was something he had said that Bartle could not remember. He walked into his warm flat and extracted the pre-cooked meal from the electro-oven. He ate with little relish abstractly thinking of the foolish little cog in the governmental machine he had talked with that afternoon. 
or was Pettigill that foolish little cog? Bartle could not help but feel there was something deep inside him that did not show in that wizened and seemingly open little face. He thought about it the rest of the evening. He looked at the clock on the night table. Twenty-three hundred hours. Pettigill's lullaby hour, he thought. Bartle chuckled and switched off the bed light. He was asleep before the puffs of air had escaped from under the covers he pulled over himself. When the phone rang at 0300, Bartle was strangely not surprised, although consciously he was expecting no call. "'Hello,' he said sleepily. "'Bartle, this is Pettigill.' The voice was Pettigill's, but the nervous, timid quality was gone. "'I assumed you did not hear the 2300 cast.' "'You assume correctly, Pettigill. What do you want?' "'Come on over to the centre. We'll split a fifth of former Section Secretary Andrew Scotch.' "'What the hell do you mean?' "'Were you serious about that therapy revolution we were talking about this afternoon?' "'I'm always serious. So what?' "'Excellent! Excellent!' Pettigill laughed. "'I've spent thirty years just waiting for such a man as you. No, I'm serious, my cynical friend. What position would you like in the new government?' "'Let's see. Why don't you make my descendants real peachy happy and make me, say, Administrator of Civilian Relations? That sounds big and important.' "'Fine, fine. Tell me, Bartle, how are your relations with psychotics?' Bartle leapt to the floor. Instantly he recalled what Pettigill had said that had disturbed him. When they had been discussing the repercussions of a miscast, Pettigill had said, It will be disastrous, and not, It would be disastrous. The devil had been planning just such a thing for God knows how long. How many of them, Pettigill? Bartle asked. A lot, Bartle, a lot, the little man answered. I would say one hundred and seventy million. I might even say a nation of psychotics, he giggled again. A smile sliced through Bartle's sallow cheeks. My relations with him would be the best. Keep that scotch handy, Pettigill. I'll be right over. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. A Thousand Dollars a Plate by Jack McKenty Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, October 1954 Narrated by Tom Trussell Sunset on Mars is a pale, washed-out, watery sort of procedure that is hardly worth looking at. The shadows of the cactus lengthen. The sun goes down without the slightest hint of colour or display, and everything is dark. About once a year there is one cloud that turns pink, briefly. But even the travel books devote more space describing the new sign adorning the canal casino than they do on the sunset. The night sky is something else again. Each new crop of tourists goes to bed at sunrise the day after arrival with stiff necks from looking up all night. The craters of the moons are visible to the naked eye, and even a cheap pair of opera glasses can pick out the buildings of the Deimos space station. A typical comment from a sightseer is, Just think, Fred, we were way up there only twelve hours ago. At fairly frequent intervals, the moons eclipse. The local chamber of commerce joins with the gambling casinos to use these occasions as excuses for a celebration. The Mars Gras includes floats, costumes, liquor, women, gambling, and finishes off with a display of fireworks and a stiff note of protest from the nearby Mars Observatory. The day after a particularly noisy, glaring fireworks display, the top brass at the observatory called an emergency meeting. The topic was not a new one, but fresh evidence in the form of several still-wet photographic plates showing out-of-focus skyrocket trails and a galaxy of first-magnitude aerial cracker explosions was presented. 
I maintain they fire them in our direction on purpose, one scientist declared. This was considered to be correct because the other directions around town were oil refineries and the homes of the casino owners. Why don't we just move the observatory way out in the desert? a technician demanded. It wouldn't be much of a job. It would be a tremendous job, said Dr. Morton, the physicist. If not for the glare of city lights on Earth, we wouldn't have had to move our telescopes to the moon. If not for the gravel falling out of the sky on the moon, making it necessary to resurface the reflectors every week, we wouldn't have had to move to Mars. Viewing conditions here are just about perfect, except for the immense cost of transporting the equipment, building materials, workmen, and paying us triple time for working so far from home. Why, did you ever figure the cost of a single photographic plate? What with salaries, fright to and from Earth, maintenance and all the rest, it's enormous. Then why don't we cut down the cost of ruined exposures, asked the technician, by moving the observatory away from town. Because, Dr. Morton explained, we'd have to bring in crews to tear the place down, other crews to move it, still more crews to rebuild it, not to mention unavoidable breakage and replacement, which involved more fright from Earth, at $7.97 per pound dead weight. Well, you figure it out. So we can't move, and we can't afford ruined thousand-dollar plates, said the scientist who had considered himself a target for the fireworks. Then what's the answer? The usual suggestion was proposed that a delegation approach the town council to follow up the letter of protest. A search through the past meeting's minutes showed that this had never accomplished anything up to date. A recent arrival to the observatory mentioned that their combined brain power should be enough to beat the games and thus force the casino owners, who were the real offenders, out of business. One of the scientists who had already tried that very scheme on a small scale, reported his results. He proved with his tabulations that in this instance, science, in the guise of the law of averages, was unfortunately against them. Dr. Morton rose to his feet. The other men listened to his plan, at first with shocked horror, then with deep interest, and finally in wild exultation. The meeting broke up, with most of the members grinning from ear to ear. "'It's lucky Dr. Morton is a physicist,' said one of the directors. "'No astronomer would ever have thought of that.' A few days later, a modest little ad appeared in the weekly publication, What to Do in Marsport. It did not try to compete with any of the casino ads, all of which featured pretty girls, but it had a unique heading— free for the first time ever your horoscope scientifically cast by the staff of the famous mars observatory learn your luck your future write or call mars observatory no charge no obligation since the horoscopes being offered were about the only things on mars that didn't cost the tourists any money the response was great the recipient of a horoscope found a mimeographed folder which contained three pages describing the present positions of the planets, where to look for Earth in the sky, and what science hoped to learn the next time Mercury was in transit. The fourth page held the kicker. It said that while the tourist's luck would be better than average at most of the gambling houses, he would lose consistently if he played at Harvey's club. Within two days, the only people playing at Harvey's were the shills. The following day, the visitors to the observatory included Harvey. The gambler was welcomed with mingled respect for his money and contempt for his occupation. He was taken immediately to see Dr. Morton, who greeted him with a sly smile. Harvey's conversation was brief and to the point. How much? he asked, waving a horoscope under Dr. Morton's nose. Just a promise, said the scientist. 
Harvey said nothing but looked sullen. You are on the town council, Morton continued. Now, the next time the question of tourist entertainment is discussed, we want you to vote against a fireworks display. He then explained how important plates had been ruined by skyrocket trails. Harvey listened with great interest, especially when Dr. Morton flatly stated that each casino, in turn, would get the same publicity in the horoscopes. The council members are all for the tourists, Harvey commented, and you guys are supposed to be nuts, like all scientists, but I'll do like you say. He reached into his pocket. Here's fifty bucks. Use it for a full page ad this time, and do the Desert Sands Casino in your next horoscope. And say, before I go, can I look through the telescope? I never seem to have had the time before. At weekly intervals, Dr. Morton did the Desert Sands, Franklin's Paradise, the Martian Gardens, and the Two Moons Club. From each owner he extracted the same promise to vote against the fireworks at the council meetings. The technique was settling down to a routine. Each victim came, made the promise, paid for the following week's ad, named the next casino, and was taken on a tour of the observatory. Then disaster struck. It took the form of an interplanetary telegram from Harvard Observatory, the parent organization. It read, Earth newspapers carrying accounts of horoscopes published by your organization, very unscientific, must stop at once, find other solution. L.K. Bell, director. Dr. Morton was eating alone in the staff dining room when he noticed a familiar face beside him. Harvey, he said, Guess you've come down to gloat over our misfortune. No, Professor, said Harvey. You've got my promise to help you boys, and I'll stick by you. It's a rotten shame, too. You just about made it. The rest of the club owners saw the writing on the wall and were going to cooperate with you when the telegram came. All of us got contact in the telegraph office, so they heard about it as soon as it arrived and stayed away. Dr. Morton said, Yes, I suppose they would. There's not much we can do now. There are thirteen members on the council, Harvey continued, and you've got five of us. If that telegram had only come one day later, no more fireworks. But I got an idea. Dr. Morton pushed aside his empty coffee cup and stood up. Let's get out in the fresh air. The town council was adding insult to injury by staging one of the biggest fireworks displays ever. It consisted of practically all skyrockets. Dr. Morton expressed wonder at their supply. Harvey explained that they were made right on Mars. He went on to tell his idea. I was real interested in everything when you took me round the first time I was here, the gambler said. The same goes for the other boys who saw the place. Most of us meant to come out here and look around some time, but you people work nights, and us mostly working nights too. We never got around to it. How about arranging an exclusive tour sometime just for the club operators and their help? Then when they see everything, you could offer to name a star after them or something. If I hadn't already promised, I'd be willing to promise, just to be able to point in the sky and say, that's Harvey's star. Dr. Morton smiled gently. That's a wonderful idea, he said, but I don't think it would work. Any stars worth looking at with a naked eye already have names. The only ones we could name after people are so far away that it would take an exposure of several hours just to see them on a photographic plate you wouldn't be able to point yours out at all. Besides, Harvard Observatory wouldn't stand for this idea either. It would make as much sense to them as you naming a poker chip after me. He sighed. But in any case, we would like to have all the owners over some time. It might improve relations somewhat. 
The two of them watched a rocket wobble all over the sky before exploding. Let's go back inside, said the physicist. Maybe we can arrange that tour for Sunday. Sunday afternoon, the visitors, presumably softened up by what one of the chemists thought were martinis, were seated in the lecture hall listening to Dr. Morton's concluding remarks. One of the technicians is working on a gadget with a photocell that closes the shutter on the film when a rocket goes up, Dr. Morton was saying. It should cut down the exposure time a great deal. Right now, every night may be significant. If the plates from any one night are spoiled, we may not be able to duplicate them for a Martian year. Mankind is preparing the first trip to another star, and the work of Mars Observatory is necessary to ensure the success of that trip. You gentlemen are rightly the leaders of Mars, and so it is up to you to decide whether or not that success will be possible. He sat down to a smattering of applause. The visitors, except Harvey, then left. It didn't go over, Professor, said Harvey. I know, said Dr. Morton. That washes out the plan. He turned to the gambler. You're the only person I can trust with this, he said. How would you like to help me make some fireworks? One week later, the two men had everything ready. That night, as quietly as possible, they moved to a position behind a fence near the skyrocket launching racks. Dr. Morton was carrying a compass, a flashlight, and a small clinometer. Harvey was struggling with two large skyrockets. He whispered, What have we missed? Or they go off too soon or something? Nonsense, Harvey, said Dr. Morton. He busied himself with the flashlight and compass, and carefully aimed one of the rockets. You forget, I am a physicist. He then aimed the other rocket and checked elevation with a clinometer. The fuels are standard, and I worked out the trajectories on the computer. Ready with your match? These are going to explode in the canal and get everybody in the canal casino all wet. He peeked over the fence to see how the regular display was doing. Here comes their finale. Ready, set, light! Covered by the launching of the last of the official display, the two rockets arced up and away. One of them did explode in the canal, and most of the casino's patrons did get wet. But the other wobbled off to the right, landed on the roof of Harvey's bachelor home, and burned it to the ground. Dr. Morton sat numbly in front of his typewriter, staring at a letter. He couldn't seem to find the right words for what he wished to say. He tried to derive inspiration from a glossy photograph lying on the table beside him. It had what looked like another skyrocket trail on it. Before he could answer it, the door opened and Harvey walked in, accompanied by two men with muscles. "'I haven't seen you since the accident, Professor,' he said. I've been trying to write you a letter, said Dr. Morton, to tell you how sorry I am about what happened, and I also have to thank you for getting that law against fireworks through the council. I'm extremely sorry it took your house burning down to convince them. I keep my promises, said Harvey. One of the men with muscles turned the radio on, loud. We're trying to get up a collection among the staff to help pay for your losses, said Dr. Morton, but the director suggested a more permanent kind of remembrance. He picked up the photograph. This will be one of the brightest objects in the sky in a few months. It won't be back again for thousands of years, but it will be around for a good while. We've just discovered it, and it is our privilege to call it Harvey's Comet. "'That's nice,' said Harvey. The first of the two men went around pulling down blinds. The other went into the bathroom and started filling the tub. "'Well,' said the physicist, looking tired and old, "'I guess there's nothing more I can say.' "'Oh, yes, there is, Professor,' 
said Harvey, with a sudden grin on his face. He turned to his muscle men. You two guys, cut out the comedy and bring it in now. The two men followed his instructions. You see, Professor, the gambler continued, I took a beating on the house, but the other club boys chipped in and made up all my losses. So I don't need your money at all. Besides, I have two things to thank you for. First, I heard about the comet from one of your men, and it's the nicest things anybody's ever done for me. One of his men came back with what looked like a round candy box. Second, that fire was the best publicity stunt I could get. It made the papers back on earth, and all the new tourists are packing into the Harvey Club. Even the other operators are playing my tables. That's why I want you to have this. He handed Dr. Morton the box. It read Harvey's Club in the centre, and Dr. Morton's poker chip around the edge. Across the bottom it said five thousand. That's dollars in it, Professor, said Harvey. Don't spend it all in one place. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Man Who Wouldn't Sign Up by Tom Purdom Writing as Thomas E. Purdom Originally published in Infinity, October 1958 Narrated by Tom Trussell all his life, people had been trying to get Henry Westing to sign up. They were all signing up themselves, and they wanted everybody else to sign up too. In college, it had been the fraternities. Mr. Westing hadn't tried to join one. But you've got to belong to something, they said. Everybody does. I don't. Sure you do. You're just being rebellious. Perhaps. Everybody's got to belong. Ask any psychologist. Perhaps. I wouldn't know. After college, it had been work. He had lost three jobs in a row for the same reason. We're sorry, Westing, but you just don't seem to fit in with the group. Don't I do my work well? Yes, but you don't seem to belong. We like men who consider themselves part of the company, not just people who work here. In the end, he had found a job in a large travel agency in the centre of Philadelphia. This is a business in which everyone at least pretends to be cynical about his work, so Westing was able to keep his position no matter how he acted. Of course, by this time, he had learned to keep his mouth shut. All around him, he watched people signing up. "'You've got to have something bigger than yourself,' they said. "'You've got to belong.' He watched them do it and went on living his own life. He loved concerts and books and plays. He loved his friends, who were good company and whom he saw often. He loved a couple of girls, too, and hoped that some day he would love one well enough to marry her. He lived a very happy life and belonged to nothing. Then one night in January, someone knocked on his door. It was a Saturday, and he was just getting dressed to go to the Academy of Music. He opened the door of his apartment and looked into the hall. There was a young man standing there. He had black-rimmed glasses and a crew-cut. He wore a slim, well-tailored suit. "'Mr. Westing?' "'Yes?' "'I'm from the organisation. We'd like you to join.' "'What organisation?' "'The organisation.' The organization for people who don't belong to any organization. I'm afraid I'm not interested. But you must be. It says here that you don't belong to anything. We're here to give you a chance to belong. What's the purpose of the organization? It gives its members a feeling of belonging to something. Everybody's joining. You don't want to be left out, do you? Not if I can help it. But I'm afraid you'll have to try somebody else. I can't. We never give up. I see. Good night, young man. 
he tried to close the door. Before he was quite certain what was happening, the young man had slipped into the apartment. "'I'm going to a concert,' Mr. Westing said. "'They're playing Brahms's first. I've never heard it, and I've been looking forward to hearing it ever since I heard his second. I'd appreciate it if you left.' "'But don't you want to belong, Mr. Westing?' "'No. Not to anything?' "'No.' The young man shook his head. "'But most people are glad to join. We offer them what they've been looking for all their lives.' "'Then go see them.' He put on his jacket and adjusted his tie. "'Care for a drink?' "'I don't drink.' "'Why not?' "'It interferes with my work. We're out to double the size of the organization. I work very hard at it.' "'Do you? Why?' "'It gives me a sense of belonging.' Mr. Westing started for the door. "'I'm about to leave,' he said. "'I think it would be best if you left, too.' The young man sighed. "'I can see where you're going to be a difficult case. "'Probably. Will you turn off the light, please?' He met his date, and immediately put the incident out of his mind. They listened to Brahms's first, and it was everything Westing had hoped it would be. Afterwards, when they were sitting in a bar, he told her about the organisation. The girl seemed surprised. It was the second time he had taken her out, and she didn't know him very well. "'You ought to belong to something,' she said. "'Why don't you join?' "'You mean that? Everybody should belong to something. You can't be useless.' "'I'm not useless. I make my contribution, more than most people, in fact.' "'But you can't just live for yourself.' "'Why not?' She struggled. "'Because you can't,' she said. He took her home when the bar closed at midnight. The conversation was one he had engaged in with other girls, but it still depressed him. He hopped the subway and went across the river to Camden, New Jersey, where they were more reasonable about the hours at which bars remain open. The next morning... He had a hangover. He was just pouring some tomato juice when someone knocked at his door. "'Just a minute,' he said. He opened the door. A man in a tweed suit stood in the hall. He had a relaxed, pleasant face, and he smoked a pipe. "'Mr. Westing?' "'Yes. I'm Dr. Cooper. May I come in?' "'I didn't ask for a doctor. I could use one, but I haven't called one yet. "'Oh, what's your trouble?' Hangover. I had a rugged night. Why? What made you do a thing like that? He shrugged. It's hard to say. Insecurity, Dr. Cooper said. Many people try to evade their insecurities by drinking. Why don't you tell me about it? He hesitated. Well, he said, it's early. Dr. Cooper started forward, and he automatically stepped back to let him in. "'Who sent you, anyway?' he asked. "'Didn't they tell you I was coming?' "'Didn't who tell me you were coming?' "'The organisation. I'm the head psychologist.' "'I should have known.' "'You sound annoyed.' "'I'm afraid I don't want to join the organisation, ever.' Dr. Cooper lit his pipe. "'I think you should,' he said. "'It would relieve you of your insecurities. "'You obviously need to belong to something.' Why? It is a natural need in all human organisms. A man by himself is incomplete and unsatisfied. He has no outlet for his energies and his talents. I have very little energy and no talent. You are being modest. I understand you have a great deal of both. Cooper looked around the apartment. Don't you want to belong, Mr. Westing? No. Don't you belong to anything? No. You're sure? You were a political canvasser in the last election, weren't you? Yes, but that was different. Didn't it give you a sense of belonging? Yes, but I didn't like it. I felt trapped. Then why did you do it? I'm a citizen. I like to keep my accounts even. Then you didn't really belong, the doctor said. Not the way you mean. This is very interesting. You honestly think you can live without belonging to anything? Yes. Don't you belong to the human race? 
Yes, and I try to keep my dues up, too, but it's more of a strain than a pleasure. Dr. Cooper puffed on his pipe. I can see where you're going to be a real challenge, he said. Thank you. I intend to be. I've got some literature outside. I think you should read it. You can leave it if you like. I will. A few more puffs. The psychologist looked extremely serene. You know, you're a very sick man. So I've been told. Why don't you let me cure you? First you'll have to convince me I'm sick. That's true. They talked aimlessly for another half hour. Cooper left, and Westing looked over the literature. He started to throw it away. Then his conscience twinged. If he was going to fight this thing, he was going to fight it honestly. He would meet their techniques of persuasion, not evade them. He sat down and read all the pamphlets. The need to belong. The sense of unity. Testimonials from members of the organization who have found salvation in its ranks. It was all very well done, and rather weakening to a man with a hangover. He sat for a long time in his apartment, brooding over it. Then he got up and threw all the literature in the trash. They'll have to do better than that, he said. The next evening, when he got back from work, he found a package in his mail. It was a long-play, high-fidelity Calypso record. The notice said it was from Get Acquainted Gift from the Jamaican Record Society. After supper, he put the record on. When it had been playing for a while, he got up and, as he often did, began to improvise dance steps to the music. It was great fun, and the record was half over before he noticed the words had been subtly changing. House built on a rock foundation will not stand. Oh no, oh no. You must join the organization now, 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 now. He snapped off the hi-fi. But the chanting went on in his mind. You must join the organization. You must join the organization. He put on his coat and went out for a walk. When he got back, he didn't feel like reading, so he turned on the television set. There was a very serious play on. He settled back to watch it. It was about a young man who lived all alone in the city and of his groping toward a better life. "'If I could only belong some place,' the young man said to the girl during the second act, "'I've never belonged anywhere.' "'Everybody should belong,' the girl said. The young man nodded and groped with his hands. "'Or else they'll be like Henry Westing,' he mumbled." Mr. Westing got up and turned off the set. He rotated it and looked at the back. There was a little box screwed in one corner. Very clever, he said. He tore the box off and went to bed. He was just falling asleep when the phone rang. He reached for it in the dark. Westing speaking. Mr. Westing, this is Miss Bale from the organisation. We're calling up to see if there are any questions you may have. I'm afraid I don't. I'm trying to sleep. So early? I felt like it. You must be terribly lonely. Why don't you come down to headquarters for cakes and coffee? We're having a good time. Miss Bale, I've done some canvassing myself. You're doing a good job, but you've got the wrong man. She laughed. It was a very pleasant laugh. Thank you, Mr. Westing. You sound like the kind of man we need. We've got a big job to do, and there's a place here for you any time you want it. Doing what? Recruiting new members. Good evening, Miss Bale. I've always tried to be a gentleman. I'd better hang up before I forget myself. He hung up and tried to sleep. The next day an economist came to see him. The day after it was a social scientist and the day after that, a political scientist. He listened patiently for a week as they sat in his apartment and explained the importance of the group to him. Man is nothing, they said, unless he belongs to a group. On the contrary, Mr. Westing said, the group is nothing unless I belong to it. That's egotism, probably. 
but he knew he was weakening. He held out with a stubborn feeling he was resisting the tides of history. He felt very brave and strong. There was a one-day lull. He woke up the morning after, and heard a sound truck blasting away in the street one floor below. "'Henry Westing does not belong! Henry Westing belongs to nothing! Reform Henry Westing! Reform Henry Westing!' "'Outrageous!' he said. He dressed, had breakfast, and started for work. People stood on their doorsteps and stared at him when he stepped onto the sidewalk. He smiled pleasantly at the driver of the truck. "'Good morning,' he said. "'Nice day, isn't it?' The driver nodded sullenly. "'Very good,' Mr. Westing thought. "'You're doing splendidly.' At work he was tired and drawn out. He had trouble concentrating. The department manager commented on it. "'You're not acting like a company man, Henry.' "'I'm a little tired. I had a hard night. What was she like?' "'Dismal.' Everything was dismal. The jingles ran through his head endlessly. So did the slogans and the words from the sound truck. He was beginning to doubt himself. Perhaps they were right. Perhaps he did need to belong. That night the sound truck was still there. It circled the block, advertising the organisation and denouncing Henry Westing. There were signs on all the houses, too. "'We belong to the organization," the signs said. There was a sign on every door, except his. He went upstairs and made dinner. Then he sat by the window and tried to think. Down below he could hear the sound truck. "'They're getting to you,' he thought. "'A little more, and they'll have you whipped. You'd better do something.' He picked up the phone and dialed. Yes, a voice answered. This is Henry Westing. Ah, Mr. Westing, I thought you'd be calling soon. You may send your representative over to my apartment this evening. Tell him to bring everything. Application forms? Everything. Whatever you use to close the deal. He'll be there at eight. I'll be waiting. At eight o'clock the young man rang his bell. He was burdened down with equipment. "'Come in,' Mr. Westing said. "'Thank you. "'What's all that you're carrying? "'Educational material. "'Mind if I set it up?' "'Go right ahead.' He poured himself a brandy and soda and watched. The young man seemed nervous and strained as he set up a hemispherical device which seemed to be a projector. Mr. Westing glanced at a leatherette folder the young man had put aside while he worked. The folder bore a neatly labelled title, Prospects. His heart skipped a beat. He made sure the young man was absorbed in his work, then he carefully leafed through the book. This Marlene Harris looks like an interesting case. What's she like? Did I leave that there? I'm sorry, I can't let you look at it. Oh, sorry, I didn't know. The young man took the folder and went back to work. "'Do you have a girl?' Mr. Westing asked. "'Too busy.' "'Oh,' he sipped his drink. "'That Harris girl certainly has been holding out, hasn't she? "'She's a tough one. I've been to see her six times. "'It's funny, too, because she's so lonely.' "'Really? "'She's too independent. Men don't like her. "'And she's pretty nice-looking, too. "'It's a shame she can't act like a woman.' "'Yes, I guess it is.' There, the young man said. Now, if you'll just sit down there. Care for a drink? I don't drink. Not even to be sociable? Sociable. Perhaps I should at that. Mr. Westing poured another brandy and soda. There was a great deal more brandy than soda. You work hard, don't you? he said. We're in the middle of a big drive now. This is a very important job. The young man took a drink, the kind a man who has always drunk water takes. Yes, I guess it is rather important, organising, getting things done, a very active life. 
That's what I like, activity. I like to live, not just sit around. Very understandable. The young man took another drink. His face underwent a subtle change. Let me turn the machine on. We'd better get started. Did you have dinner yet? I've been too busy. Good, good. Good? Good that you work so hard. Shows character. Thank you. Now if you'll just sit back there, we'll turn the machine on. The young man seemed to be having trouble focusing his eyes. Westing lit a good cigar and offered his guest one. To be sociable, he said. In that case, all right. You should have another brandy to go with it. He handed him one as he spoke. The young man took it, gulped it down automatically, and turned on the machine. Westing pulled on his cigar and settled back in his chair. He made sure there was another drink by the boy's arm. Do you know anything about drinking? Why, no, I don't. Three's the custom. Three drinks and your friends. You belong. Then I guess I'd better. The room turned dark. Stars covered the walls. The young man took another swallow. To what do you belong? a deep voice said. Of what are you a part? In all this vast universe you alone are nothing. You alone have no meaning, but you as part of something bigger. A sunrise crept along the walls. The colouring was very good, and Mr. Westing enjoyed it immensely. Next to him he heard a low sound. The young man was singing. "'It's nice to watch the room spin, isn't it?' Mr. Westing asked. "'I was just thinking that. It's beautiful.' "'I know. Excuse me a minute.' He got up and took the phone into the next room. As soon as he was out of earshot, he dialed the number he had memorised earlier. The phone buzzed a few times. "'Hello?' a woman answered. "'Is this Miss Marlene Harris?' "'Yes, who is this?' "'My name is Henry Westing. There's a man here trying to get me to join the organisation, and I saw your name in your picture in his prospects book. "'Oh, are they after you, too?' "'They've been after me for a long time.' Your picture looks very attractive, Miss Harris. Thank you. Do you like music? Yes, I do. A few minutes later, he tiptoed into the living room. The film was still playing, the persuasive voice still speaking. Now it was martial music, and there were flags all over, waving, inspiring. It takes two, Westing thought. Alone they were getting me but the two of us together will be stronger. He bent over the couch. The boy was asleep and dreaming. His face looked peaceful. Mr. Westing turned on a record. It was an unexpurgated reading of the Arabian Nights. He placed the speaker close to the boy's ear. Then he got dressed and went out to meet Marlene. He had beaten them once again. Maybe they'd get him some day, but way down deep he didn't believe it. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Hysterio by Maurice Borden Originally published in Amazing Stories, November 1961 Narrated by Tom Trissel Daytimes Woodard wasted little speech on the other guests at the summer hotel. Biddies and garrulous men, fools one and all, he told himself. They had come to be with nature, they said, but the clear deep lake with its rocks and pointed firs and the mountains beyond were merely a backdrop for their inane gabble. They had come for health and renewal, clucking of the ravages of city life. Yet scarcely a one but had acquired some absurd malady. They had turned the small hotel into a hospital for twitches and borborigums, 
as if, because they were paying their way, they must give the climate work to do. As if, thought Woodard, they were hiring the warm sunlight, the cool sweet air, to mend their palsies, tachycardias, facial tics, or rheumatic twinges. Relishing the fact of being resented, and the illusion of being sought after, he kept himself to himself. But this sort of thing must not be carried too far. Directly after dinner, for fifteen minutes before his evening walk, he mingled with the rest as graciously as their recollections of the day's snubs permitted. He had settled upon this course early in the summer, circulating, at the break-up of the dinner-hour, among as many guests as time allowed, he fell in benignly with all topics, however foolish. On the last of these fence-mending tours, he tuned in to elderly Mrs. Jensen. "'But why?' she was asking plaintively. "'Has poor Mr. Ward's body not risen?' "'What a conversational godsend, that presumed drowning!' The old girl had stopped circulating romantic rumours about himself. She had relegated her newly developed lumbago to second place. Woodard smiled inwardly. Of course, several times in the past three weeks he had heard her question answered. So, if she listened, had she? How sensible of himself to budget his day's quota of chit-chat! Glancing at his watch, he saw that he had two minutes left, enough time for a terse review. The lake is very deep in parts, and there the cold would prevent the gas from forming that would raise the body. Mrs. Jensen fidgeted. It was one thing to repeat a question. Must one listen while someone else repeated the answer? But no clothes were found, Mr. Woodard! As he flinched at her corruption of his name, she whimpered, "'On the entire shore of this big, big lake! Not a stitch of clothing!' Woodard nodded sympathetically. Possibly he rushed from the hotel in a state of undress. Was he a frolicsome type? "'He was a lovely gentleman,' she said coldly. "'Ah, possibly the lake didn't know that.' His fifteen minutes were up. He nodded curtly. But just then Mr. Nodus joined them. Nodus, who dined at the hotel, was summering noisily with his hi-fi apparatus in a cottage far down the lake. Every guest in the place had spent at least one evening there hearing the most incredible sound effects music can offer. Every guest, that is, except Woodard. He had known for weeks that the man would invite him. He had known with equal certainty that he would decline. How often, feeling himself watched, had he glanced toward the table where Nodus ate with his two silent house-guests. Each time he had met the impassive stare of the large baby face, had stared coolly an instant, had looked away. And now Nodus had the effrontery to grasp his arm. "'Interested in swimming, Woodard?' he said loudly. Me too, swimming and music. Well, you're invited to a concert. Works out tonight's the night I can fit you in. You can follow us in your car. About five minutes. Uh, oh, but Mr. Donus, is it? Nodus? I, I'm not, not. Woodard saw Mrs. Jensen's lips curve in a hateful smile. He lost his nerve. Panicking, he fumbled for words. Fumbling, he was lost. Five minutes,' Nodus repeated. Mrs. Jensen sighed spitefully. "'Mr. Woodard doesn't know what he has in store.' Scarcely glancing to his right at the lake that lay calm in the hazy twilight, Woodard drove behind Nodus and company. Hi-fi, indeed! Torturous device of a science-ridden culture! How had he let himself in for the evening ahead?' Why had he permitted this trespass upon his privacy? But when, after some eight miles, the convertible ahead slowed and signalled for a left, he checked the impulse to keep going on around the lake and back to the hotel. Nodus would think him crazy. He would think it aloud in the dining-room, 
ostensibly to the deferential genies, the man and woman who were vacationing with him, but he would think it in a voice that carried. Woodard pulled up beside the other car in the fur-fringed clearing. Noda stood waiting with his two shadows. "'Russ will take her to the studio,' he said briskly. "'The girl and I will be along in a minute.' He chuckled, his eyes scanning Woodard's face. "'No neighbours here to raise a fuss. No knocking, no kicks or squawks.' "'Only from me,' Woodard thought, following the leader to a two-car garage some distance from the cottage. Inside, Russ slid shut the door, then flipped a switch that lighted half a dozen table lamps of the beaded fringe variety. Woodard stared in amazement. Heavily carpeted with scatter rugs, the place was walled and ceilinged with fibreboard. On three walls, including the door side, were stuck triple rows of ornamental covers from long playing records. Running the length of the fourth wall, left of the entrance, a counter rose waist high, its side hung solid with more record covers. On the left end of this counter was an elaborate system of dialed boxes which Woodard summed up vaguely as player, amplifiers, filters, and so on. On the right, eight open wood boxes of records. On the centre of that wall was a large clock with a sweep second hand. Directly beneath, an empty rack of record cover size, beside which a neatly printed sign read, Now Playing. "'Quite amazing,' Woodard remarked truthfully. "'Well,' he dropped into the centre of three chairs, right-angling the dial-boxes. "'Might as well sit.' But Russ, who had been smiling dreamily, was suddenly agitated. He shook his head. He opened and shut his mouth like a fish. As Woodard felt his poise threatened, the door slid open. Nodus entered, preceding Miss... Miss but her name hadn't ever been mentioned. Seeing where Woodard sat, he frowned. No, no, he said, that won't do. You'll be better off. Woodard repeated, I'm utterly amazed by all this. Notice's expression softened. Is a garage, as you can see, four hours at the start of the summer to convert it to a sound room, three and a half hours at the end to reconvert it, on the nose in both instances. Half-hour discrepancy there. We're working on that. Would it understood that we included the pair, whose life currents evidently flowed from the master's battery. Job's all broken down, said Notice. I do certain things. Rust does certain things. The girl, she bridled as he jerked an elbow towards her, does her little chores. The girl? Would she see fifty again? But Woodard felt himself wanting to placate a sensation both new and unpleasant. The details must be very interesting, he said weakly. Notice his face had gone stern again. Won't do, he backtracked curtly. You'll be better off over there. He indicated a lone chair directly opposite the now playing sign. Acoustically speaking, the most effective location in the studio. Clinical and considered, his tone brooked no protest. Woodard stumbled embarrassedly to the chair. You can see, Noda stated, if you look down, all the chalk marks where we were experimented with positions. And Woodard did see. Dozens of white marks on the rug around the chair legs, close together as if fractions of an inch were vital. As Nodus moved to the dial boxes, Russ and the girl dropped like wraiths into chairs. She nearest Woodard, he in the middle, leaving the place by the apparatus for Nodus. Woodard thought, God, but he has this worked out. He's a tyrant, a baby-faced ogre, and these two goops are in bondage to him. It came to him that Nodus was curiously untanned for a devotee of swimming. "'What do you weigh, Woodard?' "'Why, a uh, oh, one-sixty, I guess?' Nodus nodded. "'Near enough.' He selected a record from the box nearest him. "'People always like a few effects before the concert,' he said. "'Preliminaries!' 
His expert hand pressed a switch and turned some dials. The room was filled with a rasping hum. Now Woodard saw what he hadn't noticed before. In the far corner, back of the counter, an unlighted cavernous area, and in its centre, black draped like an oracle of doom, the speaker system. Russ and the girl looked dismayed even before Noda snapped, Oh, oh, something's not right. Russ, go outside and check the grounding. He pulled Russ to him and whispered. Russ nodded and slipped quietly out. I could still go, Woodard thought. The hell with any stories he'd spread. I'd... But the girl was staring at him, serene and knowing, as if she read thoughts. The rasp ceased, and the room went still. After a few minutes, Russ entered and took his seat by the girl. Now Nodus assumed a pedagogical stance, a platform manner. This, he said, holding the player arm poised above the whirling record, is the Victoria Falls, Zambezi River, taken at 78 rpm, which I still consider the ideal speed. Perfect studio conditions not possible, of course, though the engineer was extremely cooperative. Noda smiled benignly. He tried to get rid of the insects. They almost got rid of him. You'll notice a treble hum in the foreground. Giant mosquitoes. Then I'll play it again, filtering out the falls. We can do that. And you'll hear the mosquitoes as if they were primary. Woodard tried to look intelligently appreciative. This will take four and one half minutes, precisely. You can check this statement against the clock. The record is longer, but I find that people stop concentrating after four and one half minutes. The room filled with the massive roar of a giant river dropping four hundred feet. Woodard clutched the arm of his chair, rejecting the nightmare fantasy of himself taking the falls in a canoe. Notice, too, was seated now, looking impassively straight ahead, like a ceremonial figure on a public stage. He was talking from the side of his mouth to Russ. He played with a pair of horn-rimmed glasses, which Woodard had never seen him wear. The girl sat raptly beating a time of her own devising. It was said, where did one hear these things? Why did one remember them? That years ago the girl and Mr. Nodus had been in love. That the new era in electronics had alienated Mr. Nodus's affections. Auxiliary priestess now to the monster that had dethroned her. The girl tapped her left wrist with the fingers of her right hand and smiled remotely. Four and one half minutes as advertised. Nodus said, raising the player arm. And now, the foreground of mosquitoes, amplified by, well, no need to be technical. Let's just enjoy it. Two and one half minutes will do. Quite so. Higher than coloratura, a whirring, a hum, as if all insect life brought out on the lake by the evening damp had swarmed into that room, and back of the keening shrillness, and ending in its behemoth anguish, was the muffled roar of the falls. Woodard squirmed, but he wouldn't pay notice the homage of warding off the insects. Forcing himself rigid, he watched the clock. His thoughts wandered to the lake, dark and deep outside, and to Mr. Ward, imprisoned by cold in the darkest depth. Two and one half minutes, exactly. Amazing, Woodard said. Antagonised by Nodus's pontifical assurance, he added spitefully, Of course, nothing sounds like that. Nodus shrugged aside the irrelevancy. Hi-fi does, he said, extracting a second record from its case. We have many requests for that number. Many. And now... An old-fashioned steam train. If you think it's coming toward you, and jump, please try not to displace your chair. About to laugh, Wood had caught himself. The man was not joking. We don't, Nodus explained, 
want to fasten it to the floor till we're perfectly certain that— He looked for confirmation to Russ and the girl. Both nodded. We've timed this one at three and one half— more precisely, he announced, three minutes and twenty-eight seconds. It was stupendous, terrifying. Wooded himself vibrated as the colossus approached, but not for anything would he have stirred. Three minutes and twenty-eight seconds it was, Nodus monologuing from behind his hand to Russ, the girl beating a new time. In the shattering silence, Woodard laughed tremulously. This must be the next thing to shock therapy. The girl tensed. Russ looked wary. What makes you say that? Nodus demanded. Why, I just meant— Woodard was unnerved. He rarely minded giving offence, but he'd like to know when and how he was doing it. I suppose, he placated, that atomic fission is more what I had in mind. Nodus looked at him suspiciously. "'There are worse things than atoms,' he said. The girl cackled, then looked blankly about as if she hadn't done it. Nodus ignored her. "'Not a family man, are you, Woodard?' "'No,' Woodard took in Nodus's quick nod. Had the omission somehow worsened his situation? "'No one to care?' cried the girl, her dark eyes gleaming archly. "'No one to miss you!' She was stilled by a flicker of Nodus's eye. On with the effects. "'Now this,' Nodus lectured, handling the new record tenderly, "'has more surface noise than I consider excusable. I keep it in my library only because—' He glared at Woodard, who had been unobtrusively removing his jacket, and now dropped it hastily to the floor. "'That won't do here!' The girl roused and floated over, picked up the offending garment, and carried it with abstracted solicitude to a hook by the door. "'Then I consider excusable. I keep it in my library only because the engineer, a really cooperative fellow, learned some very important principles of underwater reproduction from taping these underseas mating calls.' Would it repress a smile as the girl, back in her seat, doubled over in silent laughter? Nodus threw her a disciplinary look. "'Like to sit in that chair yourself?' he muttered, indicating Woodard's place. Instantly she sobered. "'Now what does that mean?' Woodard asked himself. Nine and one half minutes will be right for this.' Fantastic that it could be recorded at all, Woodard had to admit, listening incredulously to the beeps and crackles, the yips and squeals and tiny shrieks. Under sea, Nodus had said, was the lake across the road a similar hotbed of solicitation? Did Mr. Ward's chilled presence cast no damper on concupiscence? Woodard pantomimed astonishment with a wondering nod. Now, with this one, Nodus recited, I say nothing. Just mention that it lasts seven seconds. Watch the clock. Woodard counted seconds so intently that it didn't interpret the four very loud preliminary gasps from the speaker. Suddenly magnified a hundred times, but undistorted, crystal clear and shattering, nearly blowing him off his chair. A monumental sneeze. His heart stopped, then pounded achingly. He looked furiously at the speaker. It should have been wetly splattered all over the place, but it rested amorphous and unshaken in its dark covering. And, said Nodus, that could have been magnified a thousand times, not in this enclosure, without distortion. An epochal recording! Deftly he switched records, turned a knob or two. Now here, an old timer, a real old seventy-eight, and if I can find the right groove, a most interesting effect. Leaning over, he whispered something to Russ, who smiled. I defy anybody to recognize. Woodard braced himself to interrupt. 
I'd like to be excused for just a minute, he begged nervously, rising. Have you? Do you happen to have? He fished for words and came up, hating himself, with, Do you have a little boy's room? Can't you wait? Well, I just thought, Woodard licked his lips. If the next effect were anything like that sneeze, he feared the consequences of delay. The girl nodded apprehensively at notice. "'It's the great outdoors,' he said grudgingly. As Woodard fumbled with the door, he added very distinctly, "'We'll be waiting.' Under the half-moon and the million stars, down the drive and across the road the lake lay darkly glowing. In the cool silence Woodard heard it lapping its shores like the licking of lips. "'What did happen to Ward?' he thought suddenly. And then he thought, "'Why don't I?' But his keys were in his jacket, and his jacket was inside. Now he noticed that Notice's car had been shifted to stand behind his own. Escape was cut off in any case. He felt a throbbing hollowness, the ache of terror. "'I'm being foolish,' he said. "'I'm going to cut it out.' The sound of a human voice, even his own, was oddly reassuring. He would stay just enough longer not to give offence. He would try to make only pleasing responses to Notice's recital, would act reverential in his shrine to the electronic screech, and when he left, he would point out with the most casual little laugh of well-feigned surprise that his car was cut off, as if it were natural but at the same time comic. When the garage door stuck, he pulled frantically. After a moment, Nodus opened it from the inside. The girl said shrilly, "'You got locked in the bathroom!' and then shook noiselessly. "'You've interrupted the sequence,' Nodus stated. "'I'm starting with the last two minutes of the mating calls, then running the sneeze again.' Woodard nodded contritely. The mating calls heard once, it turned out, were heard for all time. But the sneeze, braced for it though he was, retained its power to shake the inner being. "'Defy anybody to recognise this sound,' challenged Nodus. It sent a cold, tickling vibration through Woodard, from the soles of his feet to his frontal sinus. When it was over, four and one-half seconds— he needed almost a minute to bring his shuddering to a halt. He saw Russ take a pad and pencil from his pocket. He did not react. A laugh, Nodus gloated, a human laugh. More precisely, a chuckle. When Marcella Sembrich produced it originally, in her recording of Coming Through the Rye, the intent was probably coy, but— in his sharp, sudden rage, Woodard forgot tact and caution. That's so unfair to a singer, to take her voice in one passage and distort it. That doesn't show what she can do. Could do, Nodus corrected coldly. But it shows what the equipment can do. I would never, Woodard began acidly. A persistent tickle in his throat was making him cough. His post-nasal drip he recognised grimly. Nodus glanced at Russ, who was jotting notes. A few more little effects, he promised. Then the concert. Woodard nodded, coughing viscously into his handkerchief. Now, just to give you some further idea, Nodus looked reproving. You have a very annoying cough. It dries up for weeks, Woodard apologised, and then— I suggest you control it, Nodus turned to the player. Some further idea, and no surprises this time, a factory whistle. He chuckled. No timing. I keep this going till I see the whites of your eyes. Woodard was sweating copiously before Nodus turned it off. He looked envyingly at the girl, not enjoying the most effective acoustic location she had sat through the outrage in a state of catatonic beatitude. 
Incredible, he gasped, coughing again. And now, in the last lap of the preliminaries, effects came thick and fast. Wooded sensibilities were still jangled from a rattling, polysyllabic belch, panicking the girl, but unjustifiable otherwise as either art or science. When a powerful soprano tweeted until it could cut steel, emitted a blood-curdling goodbye forever, tosty rendered by Medea, and as Wooded tried to formulate some idea about unseemliness, he was shaken to his bowels by the agonised shriek of a subway rounding a curve. Next, tyres screeching on hot asphalt. Not a surrealist poem, and anyway Wooded's critical faculties were pretty well blasted. Then a dentist's drill. Wooded struggled to make sense of Notice's remarks about a gum cavity and a midget microphone. Finally, perhaps most devastating of all because it suggested evil in bright sunlight, the tender brooded over by the sinister, the excited yelps of girls at play, the bouncing of a ball and the rush of feet across a wood floor, a shrill drawn-out whistle and the voice of a gym instructor screaming, "'That's enough, girls!' The Pepsi-Cola ladies' basketball team, eleven and one-half seconds. Woodard peered, and certainly from trauma, to learn that the concert proper was at hand. I run through a few things, parts of things, interesting sections, Notice lectured, playing idly with his glasses. A little programme most people seem to like. Time was, Woodard would have snapped, I happen not to be most people. But his pulse was pounding, his eyes watering, racked with coughing, trembling with post-sonic shakes. He could scarcely be called himself. So he tried to nod appreciatively. If he could identify more, really participate, then he might overcome the sensation of being one with three against him, and his sinus might stop dripping. The violin! Nodus announced, for the first time placing a record cover on the now-playing rack. Some unaccompanied Bach partitas. Wooded laughed hoarsely. It's been my theory, he coughed. Yes, Nodus held the player arm poised. Now we'll have nineteen. Wooded struggled for recovery. It's been my theory, he croaked, that Yehudi makes them up as he goes along. Russ stared for a moment, then went on writing. "'Do I understand,' Nodus asked with cold hatred, "'that you refuse to listen to a few unaccompanied Bach partitas?' Wooded grovelled. "'The privilege of hearing partitas on this superlative equipment. "'Refuse? Oh, most certainly not!' He collapsed in a fit of coughing. Mollified, Nodus said, I'll wait till you pull yourself together. Meanwhile, you may like to know that of the records my dealer sends me, and he knows my taste, mind you, I keep one in eight, and that one I exchange on the average three times before I find a copy I can admit. Woodard wanted desperately to concentrate. Here was something solid to work on. Did Nodus keep one record in eleven, or one in twenty-four? It depended, of course, on whether x equaled 8 plus 3, or 8 times 3. Surely one should be able, but he was straining beyond his limit. It was as if some mental spine, which in a past existence had sustained him, were numbed or missing. Nodus was staring, so with an odd expectant smile was the girl. To show that his wits had never left him, Woodard blurted out, "'The composer never t intended the music to sound like this.' "'Like what? The partitas were all wrong!' Now his voice kept breaking. "'A composer and a performer should have some say, not be fed into equipment like this, and—' and Another paroxysm prevented his concluding. "'And you used to start sinuses running!' "'I haven't played the partitas yet, Woodard.' That stopped the cough. Not played them? Then why did he feel? 
He found himself thinking with curious gentleness of the guests at the hotel who mocked nature with their complaints, and vast as his sudden pity was for them, it was vaster still for himself, but he tried to latch on to one worthwhile thought. I have nothing to fear but fear itself. Nineteen and a half minutes! Relentlessly Nodus lowered the arm. Wooded tried clinging to the worthwhile thought, but it kept shimmering off in the dissolving world. It wouldn't come right. I have nothing to fear but all mankind, he kept hearing. And maybe it was better that way. At least he knew. Finally he asked himself, How did I get into this? I who always kept myself to myself, to myself, to myself. Oh, he was whirling, whirling, and no one could count his RPMs. Myself to myself to— He slumped unconscious in his chair. Eleven minutes and thirty-one seconds of partitas had elapsed. Notice so remarked to Russ, who made note. And the concert continued. But there is a small point in detailing Notice's accounts, as sensibly delivered as before, of the various selections. Now he explained his choice of Bendemir's stream as a follow-up to the partitas. His apologies for the surface scratches that made the Valkyries ride sound unlubricated. His cautionings about what to look for in the Romeo and Juliet overture. His meticulous timing of these and the other recordings. Thirty-six minutes and twenty seconds after Wooded's cerebral disintegration came his impalpabilization. Three hours, forty-one minutes, twenty-one seconds. Notice intoned, and Russ jotted down the melancholy figures. The girl emitted a small shriek of joy and started impetuously for the chair that had been Woodard's. But Notice raised a preventive arm. Not yet, he warned. Not for a few minutes. There may be anarchic sonic residuum. We don't know. And anyway, what's there to see this time? Absolutely nothing left. Except his car, said Russ. He spoke with a lisping dreaminess. You'll park it by one of the fishing piers. Wood had said as he left here that he'd stop for a late swim. Just lovely, sighed the girl, and Russ nodded in slow motion. Noda smiled almost reluctantly perfectionist that he was, it would be long before he was wholly satisfied. He turned to the girl. Your idea of substituting the partitas for the Marla farewell was very sound. I'm interested in the reasoning. Her nostrils flaring at the heady draught of his praise, she giggled shyly. I hoped the partitas would work, because Marla really fractures me. That farewell would have finished me, even where I was sitting. His glance rested on her, as if he would bear this in mind. Then he said, It should be safe to look closely now, and he led his technicians to the vacant chair. No nasty mess to clean up, raved the girl. Nothing like that ward with his dreadful post-distillation residuum and as Nodus and Russ exchanged smiles at her woman's viewpoint, "'Who's next?' she demanded. Russ was inspired. "'That frightful old woman at the hotel!' Nodus regarded the girl through narrowed eyes. "'The one's been spreading those half-wit tales about you and me.' She did not meet his look. "'You'd never get Miss Jensen here alone.' Then with her friends, he said expansively. With the upturned hand he warded off protest. I can tell you now that I expect to be ready, before the season is ended, for group therapy. He ignored her little scream of delight, Russ's slow smile of wonder. Perhaps you don't quite realise, this evening, how important it's been. His voice had begun to tremble, 
and he rested a moment to steady himself. After all the years with warts and small excrescences, he said, his eyes misting, the humiliation of our work with corns. He raised his head proudly. But it was to this that it all was leading. He pointed to the undefiled chair. And now it begins to look as if we, and with no billions backing us, mind you, would be ready before the no-fallout bomb. The girl looked faint with wonder as Rust lisped complacently, and without the disastrous destruction of priceless commodities. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. You know, many of these stories were written in a time where fifty years ago was in the future.